Melissa, wow. What a phenomenal documentary. So can you tell me, why was it important for you to tell that story? And then why was it important for that story to be told now? Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. And thank you to all you folks who are staying around for this conversation. It means so much just to be able to thank you for watching the film and for coming out to support art, especially after the long year that we've had. So I hope you enjoyed it. This film was important to make because it felt like it was the time and the time for us to really look back and in order to look forward, which is so much of what's happening now as the country's on the eve of a racial reckoning and we are finding ourselves as we reemerge from our quarantining and really trying to assess how to move forward collectively and apart, but also just this idea of finding this truth and this beauty in this story and to see how it really reflects on where we are today in our strive for um, equality, inclusion, diversity, all of those issues, but also just a belief in the beauty of Black culture and the importance of reminding ourselves of our greatness. And there's something so, there's so much simplicity in this film centered in Black joy. And especially after all we've been through in the last year and the last 50 years, really, I thought it was really important to be able to make a film that was not really responding to so much trauma. I like to say that it's trauma-free Blackness. We don't always have that opportunity, but we have been through so much and we're always reacting. And of course we are, and what a horrible year it's been. But we are also reacting as a people, as a culture to everything that has held us back, discriminated against, against us, all the inequalities, the injustices, the, the, the violence against the black body and the black politics. So in a way I thought how refreshing it could be to look back at another revolutionary time. And as we're being nostalgic to also learn from that time and see who are the, the next generation of soul making those leaps and bounds. And there's so there's such a through line between yeah. what was happening in the struggle for equal rights and inclusion, diversity and, and uh, gender parity and all of these things. And what, what's happening now, even post COVID as we re-enter society. So it was a refreshing way to really remind ourselves of our greatness and to see that beauty and that joy, but to also see how far we've come and how yet how far yet we have to go in terms yeah. of fairness and um, equality. I love that you talk about greatness uh, because something that I would say to young scholars when I was a professor was walk in your greatness and make the ancestors proud. Oh, and that was something uh, Mama Tony Thorpe said that. And so I, I definitely believe that that film, that this film does that. So my, my, my first question is, I jumped right in and said, wow, but can you introduce us to who you are and your relationship to Ellis? Sure. So I'm Melissa, Melissa Hazlip. I'm the producer, director, and writer of the film you just saw, Mr. Soul. And I also happen to be the niece of Ellis Hazlip. So he was my spirit animal, but he was also my babysitter, <laughs> you know, just pretty basic. <laughs> and then it turned into a wonderful relationship and he guided me as a young artist. And I was able to work with him as an assistant, as an assistant producer associate, and really see and understand how he was walking in this truth of elevating the culture and pushing the culture forward and how he would embrace artists and really was somewhat of an Afrofuturist in his ability to see what would be great for us down the line and almost see artists in a way that they couldn't see themselves. Um, and that was a real extraordinary talent that he had, an uncanny ability to not only know what the culture needed, but to see the brilliance of the artists um, in their, before their prime sometimes. Was that brilliance part, of, was it their artistry? Was it their humanity? Was it like, what do you think he identified as their brilliance? I think it was a little bit of both because he was, as you, as we tried to convey in the film, he was 
a, a real a real person, you know, a person's person first. All of his relationships were built on kindness, love, respect, and a deep, deep love affair with our blackness. <laughs> You know, and so that sort of unapologetic truth was where he was coming from. Mm -hmm. And it it was just completely unusual to have that kind of person in a role like that, in a position like that. Someone who is so generous, you know, who was hip, who was smart, who was queer, who was unapologetically black and who was all about um, black institution building. How can we build these institutions, which we now know and love so well, Alvin Ailey, you know, yes. everything, museums, music, these are things that we look to for our culture. But that was a moment when there hadn't been value ascribed to the culture. Mm -hmm. And so he had to show everyone that in seeing the humanity and seeing us in our dignity and our greatness, you could see the value of the work we were doing and the, all the contributions we brought to the culture and to the complexity of life because he didn't see us as a monolith either. Right. It wasn't right. sort of like caping hard for a certain person or a vibe or an individual, but he was saying, look at the myriad talents that we have and, and see us in all of our inconsistencies and complexities and, and just see that full total spectrum of the black family. So I have a question for you. What do you believe, I mean, because all of the advertisements that I have seen have Mr. Soul, Soul is all caps with the exclamation point. What is Soul, three, what, what was Soul for him? And what do you hope in our present day, the audience that just watched this, that they will understand, comprehend, feel soul to be. So what was it for him? And what do you hope that the audiences will feel or receive soul to be? Wow, that's a great question. Because on the one hand, you know, the reason we called it Mr. Soul was because that was the nickname that he earned. Everyone knew that there was a show called Soul and it was actually written all caps with an exclamation point. Uh, his his name, however, was a little bit harder to pronounce. And so when they saw him in Harlem after the show, walking the beat, saying hello to the sisters and brothers, you know, they would say, there goes, um, that's happed up. Mr. Soul, that's Mr. Soul, <laughs> you know, that name, that moniker was given to him. And I think it really represented so much because what he was trying to do with the show was bring the full total black experience to the masses at a moment when we really hadn't been in anyone's living room, you know, because of Jim Crow, because of being on the hills of the civil rights movement, we were in a very racist and divided society, similar to today, but a little bit different. <laughs> so the notion of what is soul is what is universal, what is the truth, but what is the soul of a nation? And, and how does that start with the soul of black people being really the progenitors of culture and love and truth in that everything we do comes from there. Our food, our culture, our art, our, our movements. Yeah. Our movements. Exactly. Yes. yes. And so he sort of housed it all under this idea of soul because it all came from there. Today, I think we could learn a lot from Ellis Hayslip, this whole idea of that he could be the help restore the soul of a nation in a way. Because when you look at this beautiful archive of you know, our favorite um, men and women of that era, but also icons of the 20th century, you really see that there is this, this beauty and this truth that was connected, mm -hmm. connected to the movement, just like the black power movement. You know? But what was that? That was about love and also strength and demanding equality, but it was about love. It was about feeding kids breakfast. You know, there's this innate beauty of the family and the truth of, and the dignity that we deserve and that that's we right. demand. And that's the same things we're fighting for now. So and many of those, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. And many of those things for that time period were absent from the media portrayals. If we even made it, um, in media meaning news portrayals, 
versus mm -hmm. the love of the community and the strength of the community yeah. and the pride um, that, that came with the community. Quick question. Yeah. As a filmmaker, uh -huh. um, given, given the, 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 uh, the breadth of all of the footage that you had to go, to, go through, <laughs> how does one, because I mean, how do you choose one interview, one soundbite, one discussion over another uh, so that you have a film that comes in less than two hours. I mean, because <laughs> this really could have been like Eyes on the Prize was uh, yes. when it came. So, 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 so why did you choose the way you did it at hour and 40 minutes versus it really could have been a series. This could have been yeah. a Netflix series. Could have been a Netflix series. Should have yeah. been a Netflix series. <laughs> okay. Could have, could have, should have. But you know, when we were first coming up with the idea, Netflix really hadn't entered our minds. We wanted it to be commensurate with the, you know, the kind of um, the naissance of this series, this idea that it came from an idea of being for the people, by the people. At that time, that was PBS. That was really the only kind of platform that you had to have really direct, um, unbiased and uh unedited, <laughs> except for a couple of moments where things got bleeped, um, this type of uh, real truth, you know, to the people, for the people, by the people. So we thought, well, that's the provenance of soul. Let's put it back on PBS. Let's find a way to make it a show and a documentary that will have a life in the public sphere. And we always thought that's the best way we'll get funded the way they did. So we, 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 mm -hmm modeled our funding after the original funding. That took much longer than we would have liked, but we just felt that it needed to have this real true, um, you know, not just personality, but, but personality in the space of the films that were out there. And so that was just really important to us that it, that it was genuine. And we knew that it kind of belonged in a larger series. In fact, we modeled it after Eyes on the Prize, the Henry Hampton School. Um, they uh, had a school that they built uh, for Eyes on the Prize and also for the Vietnam series. It's, it was like a think tank where they brought together writers, authors, poets, um, you know, Pulitzer Prize winning historical novelists and everyone who could come together to create somewhat of an academic spine for the project. So it was properly researched, a million percent accurate and, you know, inscrutable in a way, but also to be voiced by all the proper supporters. So we did that, but we knew we, we only had what we hoped would be an hour and a half of airtime, wherever it would be broadcast on PBS or elsewhere. But, you know, I actually thought this could be one chapter really if someone were making a three part series on like the black arts movement mm -hmm. up until that moment. And I actually discussed it with Louis Messiah because he said, this needs to be done. And Mr. Soul would just sit squarely in the middle. And I'm like, but who's going to do the other two? <laughs> series? And should I wait? You know, it's, it's been years already. Um, so that's why we just decided not to wait and to well, do it off. And, and it was hard to decide what went in. But the, the principal factor, sort of the deciding factor was, could the footage speak directly to the story? And we had three stories to tell. The story of Soul from 68 to 73, that's one part. That's like storyline A for all you filmmakers out there. Storyline B is a story of Ellis Hazup, which is a little bit of a hybrid documentary, just dropping in on those five years though, not cradle to grave, just 68 to 73. Then storyline C is the zeitgeist, right? What was happening in the nation during that time that would have given rise to a show like Soul to allow it to exist. So we have these three storylines that we're speaking to. And then the job becomes, how do we collapse those three stories into one? Mm -hmm. And so therefore everything in each story has to speak to the other two. So if we're using a, a clip from the show, it has to make some sort of reference to the, to the zeitgeist, what's happening in the nation, and also to Ellis's life. And so that was like our, if you will, our sorting hat for, 
any uh, Harry Potter fa- fans out there <laughs> figure out like, well, how everything had to earn its way in. There couldn't mm. be any extraneous, you know, we had to be economic with our storytelling as editors. It's 130 episodes of pure excellence, black excellence. So say there, so do you have? Inside? Like I had to fight, like, no, I'm going to have two Al Green songs, okay? <laughs> Because okay. I'm not gonna. Don't make me have to decide between trying to be <laughs> alone and you know, let's stay together. Same thing with Stevie Wonder. Yeah. So, so do you have a favorite? I, you know. I'm sorry. Do you have a favorite performance? Oh, I have so many, and some of them didn't make their way in, and you know they had to. As as I said, they had to answer to those three, yeah. those three questions. And if we like, for instance, had this incredible. Um, clip with Cicely Tyson mm. may she rest in peace this was before she made her transition but we couldn't get an interview with Cicely and we tried so hard to get an interview with Miss Tyson but she was very busy on Broadway for a couple of years mm-hmm. and then she became a little bit more um, you know particular about the things she did and even though we brought on Blair Underwood who played her son like three times on Broadway and yes, like, yes. Oh, we'll get Mrs. Miss Tyson don't worry we just couldn't make it work. And so because we couldn't have her speaking to that sequence, we found a way to get her into the film in the narrative with other people speaking about her or as an example, when we were talking about Ellis being a good listener, you know, there he was like wrapped in attention looking at her because he loved her so much. So we found ways around making it work. But again, it always had to speak to something that was happening in the story. So that was the rule. And the okay. only time we broke it was when I say we have to have Gladys Knight <laughs> and the Phipps. And she, again, we couldn't get her um, in the interview. So what we did was we used it as an expansion moment when we were seeing all the artists at the height of their career. And then we land on her singing, if I were your woman. So she earned her way in there too. <laughs> so I only have two more questions for you. If the show had not been canceled, Mm -hmm. do you think, do you believe things would be different today? And if so, how so? Oh, that's a good question because, and it's Questlove who says at the end, you know, what if we'd had this show for 50 years or 20 more years, even more than five years? Think, imagine how different our lives would have been. And I think it's a really important question to end on because it shows us that this idea of erasure in our culture and how Uh, the contributions of what we bring as people of color, as women, as queer folks, all the people represented in the film, non-binary folks, you know, women, there's so much contributions that we've made that are not seen or not valued or not documented or the history we're not learning. Why are we learning about Tulsa a hundred years later? There's so many things that we need to say and to, to, to put ourselves back in the narrative, if you will. And so I think if soul had kept going, it still would have struggled during that time of assimilation through the 70s when everything was becoming super mainstream and black exploitation and everything happened. But I do think it would have found its footing. I think we could still have a show like Soul today, but it would have to be on a different platform. Uh, one that was not commercially motivated <laughs> and not subject to, you know, either ratings or uh, bleepings. <laughs> <laughs> Because that, that part of the beauty of Soul, yeah. that it was completely unapologetically Black and um, you never knew what was going to happen. But it but the most important thing was people were being themselves. Wow. You know, Black people being themselves. And sometimes that's all we want. That's right. That's right. My final question is, we, Maria Del Socorro Lopez, she wanted this film for our first, our inaugural Juneteenth celebration weekend. And so what do you think that your uncle would say that uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina, the North Carolina Museum of Art is showing it on a large scale level to persons of, we hope, many different races as part of a Juneteenth celebration. What do you think that he would say? 
I think Ella Pesa would be so thrilled and so honored to be a part of this Juneteenth celebration. Number one, because I don't think y'all know, but the Hazlips originate in North Carolina, in Greensboro, North Carolina. We did not. Yes, and there's a huge Hazlip compound there. And Ellis Hazlip would go there every summer without his shoes in the red clay and help farm the tobacco. And it was a, my great grandmother was a free woman of color and she had her own farm and her own land. It was very, very special. And that's where the kids grew, went from DC and during the summer. So the boys the would get in trouble or get picked on, you know, by the police or anybody else of authority. Cause those are some dangerous times, you know, in the twenties and thirties. Cause Ellis Hazlip was born in 1929. So just remember what that was like. That's right. That's right. Being a child of literally of the depression. Exactly. And oh, I think wow. it would mean so much to him that we're having this moment to reimagine ourselves, but also re-examine our past as a way to understand our future. I think that's what he was doing all the time. He was curating the culture, you know, giving us a gift to ourselves, the gift of our own beauty. You know, it was a, People say, oh, this is such a, a love letter to your uncle. And I say, no, it's more a Valentine to Black culture because uh, it's a gift to us all. And we all need it to be reminded of our greatness. Well, I thank you for just taking a little bit of time to speak uh, with me. So much. Uh, I wish I could be there in person. I want to thank every, each and every one of you for watching the film and coming out to tonight to see and support the museum. And thank you so much for having us. It's such a treasure and an honor today. And what a full circle moment for your family and for um, the ancestors yeah. that toiled in the land and now we get a chance to celebrate their resilience. So thank you. Thank you. And especially on the eve of Juneteenth, you know, our emancipation, it couldn't be a better moment to celebrate our freedom and to wish for the greater freedom of our ancestors, but also our future. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you.